But as I continued down the thermometer to our next stop, 91.4 degrees, I'm about to discover that sometimes the opposite can be true. This is actually a device to induce hypothermia in patients. Excuse me, have you never heard of first do no harm? Hypothermia kills you. Dr. Cliff Calloway is a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. But there are situations in which hypothermia can be beneficial. For example, uh, patients after cardiac arrest. Patients like Susan Copen, a mother of three. A few years ago, she set out for a run with friends. It was a beautiful Sunday morning in November. She had no idea what was in store. We're about two miles into the run. When a heart valve suddenly failed. I put my hands on my knees and then collapsed on the sidewalk. Her heart stopped. I was gone. Cardiac arrest. Paramedics arrived. They were able to stabilize her and transport her to the hospital. Fortunately, Callaway and his colleagues were there. Their goal? To stop the brain damage that immediately follows cardiac arrest. She was in a coma. We used cooling blankets for hypothermia therapy. To prevent permanent brain damage in the aftermath of cardiac arrest, they dropped her body temperature to 91 degrees. Two days later, they warmed her back up. And soon after, came around and uh, talked to her husband for the first time. I said, in Shadyside Hospital, honey. You never made it home from your run on Sunday. A year later, she had fully recovered. The hypothermia treatment saved my life, saved my brain, and I'm a mom and a wife like I was before. The procedure that saved her life is called therapeutic hypothermia, and I'm about to discover how it works. Therapy started. I recognize her. She's the lady on the Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> this device has water coming in through this tubing and pulls heat out of your body. It's very cold. Just like the Army's cooling vest. But here, in order to fight brain damage, Callaway brings down body temperatures to 91 degrees. It lowers the metabolism. Um, it reduces brain swelling. It reduces the likelihood of having seizures. This has proved remarkably effective. The odds of waking up are almost uh, two to three times greater for the patient with hypothermia treatment compared to the patient without. But amazingly, in North America, only 40% of cardiac arrest patients get this treatment. Wait, it triples your chance of survival, but only 40% of patients get the treatment? Yeah, uh, it's disappointing. We really wish it was done uh, more reliably for more patients. Yeah, me too. But there's a limit. His treatment can save only the fortunate few cases where paramedics bring back a heartbeat within minutes. Many trauma patients die on the way to the hospital. But biochemist Mark Roth says he has a way to save many of them by getting colder, a lot colder. Well, a simple way to think about David is that we're trying to take the emergency out of emergency medicine. For years, he's been trying to develop a method that could one day buy trauma patients time by dropping their core temperatures down as far as 60 degrees. The problem is that when people get that cold, it usually kills them, usually. There are these outliers. He believes the answer to saving thousands of lives lies within these mysterious cases. Cases of people who suffered hypothermia so severe it stopped their hearts and yet they came back to life. Consider the case of Janice Goodger. To the brink of death and back. Her heart stopped. She was unconscious in the freezing snow for four hours. She was brought to the hospital. 24 hours later, walked out of the hospital refusing any treatment and has been fine since. Her core temperature dropped to 70 degrees. Another example, Erica Norby in Canada. A one-year-old, her core temperature dropped to 61 degrees after she wandered into freezing cold weather wearing nothing but a diaper. They didn't find her till the morning. After two hours without a heartbeat, she too was revived. And also made a full recovery. But no one's gotten colder than Anna Bagenholm. Has a record for the lowest core temperature of 56.7 degrees Fahrenheit. 
She was skiing down a waterfall gully near Narvik in North Norway when she fell headfirst into a river. Clinically dead for three hours. Three right. hours? Right. It took doctors nine hours to revive her. You came back to life? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Anna Borgenholm is back at work and well enough to be with us. In each of these cases, their hearts stopped beating for hours, yet their brains weren't damaged by lack of oxygen. How do the exceptions come to be? There must be some way to exist out there and not require oxygen. There has to be, or these people would be dead. He's searching for a way to do the same for trauma patients, curb their demand for oxygen and not damage the brain by cooling them way down. But there is a big problem. If you're trying to use the cold to create medical benefit, there's a sort of fundamental problem. Mammals fight that and they make heat using up resources in your body in order to do that. As I discovered when I was shivering in the Army's test chamber, when people get cold, their metabolism actually increases and they burn more oxygen to make heat. That's what killed the rangers in the swamp. As they fought to stay warm, their bodies burned through all the available calories, starving their brains of oxygen. Because that's the fuel that once you burn through it, you are dead. Roth knew that the reason that Anna Bagenholm and the others survived and the rangers didn't is that they were able to somehow shut off their body's demand for oxygen. But how could he do the same? So how do I do that? That was a real puzzle. The answer came to him one night while he was watching TV. While sitting on my couch at home, watching a Nova show <laughs> about a cave in Mexico, they said cave air had a little bit of hydrogen sulfide in it. So we wear these gas masks to help filter out the hydrogen sulfide. And she said that if you go in there without this respirator, then you will collapse to the ground. He immediately thought, that's it. He thought that hydrogen sulfide might just be the key. He knew that it naturally occurs in small quantities in the brain where it helps the cells regulate oxygen consumption. But he also knew that too much of it overwhelms the cells, turning off their ability to absorb oxygen, starving them. He wondered if he added just a little to the air to increase the amount in the brain by just a minute quantity, that instead of starving the brain, he could drastically reduce its need for oxygen. He tried it on mice. Room air laced with hydrogen sulfide. After three hours, its core temperature drops almost 30 degrees. The mouse is hovering now at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually, the mouse would fight the cold and burn through its supply of oxygen. The mouse no longer responds to cooling by making heat. It actually just gets colder. Because of the hydrogen sulfide, its brain's demand for oxygen has dropped by 90%. An animal in this state would survive otherwise lethal oxygen deprivation. Roth thinks that he can do the same for people. The goal is to clinically duplicate the miracle that saved these people's lives by delivering hydrogen sulfide intravenously. And if he can do that, he will revolutionize emergency medicine and save thousands of lives. It seems the farther down the thermometer we go, the more potential cold has for saving lives. So why stop at 60 degrees? Why not get even colder? To freeze it, like in the movies. Suspended animation. Yes, suspended animation. It's inevitable. To make human time capsules. Powers volunteer to have himself frozen or to travel to another solar system. I've tucked my crew in for the long sleep. But there's a reason this is called science fiction. The human body is about 60% water. And when water changes from a liquid into ice, the molecules stop moving around freely and lock together to form crystals. And that destroys cells. So far, no one has been able to get around that problem with people. But there is a creature that has. So we find it uh, generally under the leaf litter. Cryobiologist John Costanzo studies an animal that has beaten the problem of freezing, hey. the North American wood frog. I got him. Some of these animals can, in fact, survive uh, the freezing and thawing of their body fluids. Back at his lab, he pulled one out from a deep freeze. Let's go take a look. Whoa. 
Oh, man. <laughs> there's no heartbeat. There's no brain waves. A dead frog. No. It's, it's, frozen. No, it's, it's a brick of ice. It's very much alive. If there's no brain activity, it's dead. Clinically, perhaps, but we've seen them thaw and come back to life. How would that be possible? Ice destroys cells, right? This frog has worked out a number of different ways to avoid that kind of damage. The frog's vital organs shrivel up, releasing their water safely away from the frog's organs. And something else happens. Most importantly, as soon as the frog begins freezing, the liver begins producing compounds that allow the cells and tissues to survive. A kind of antifreeze, or as Costanzo calls them, cryoprotectants. Cryoprotectants, huge quantities. Which protect the frog until the spring, when something amazing happens. The ice begins to melt, and the water returns to its usual location, so the cells take the water back up. And after a time, the heart begins beating again. We don't know how this happens. It just spontaneously resumes beating. That's crazy. That's one of the first signs that the frog is really not dead at all. It's alive. And then the, the frog begins to breathe. Eventually, the frog will be able to move its limbs, sit upright, and eventually, it can hop away. With these cryoprotectants, the frog has survived the cold of winter. If we could figure out a way to do this for people, we could save lives, not by freezing our bodies, but by preserving our organs for transplantation. That's because organs, even on ice, have a limited shelf life. Hearts, for example, last at most six hours. Thousands of people die each year waiting for an organ. But could we not just inject these cryoprotectants into our bodies? Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Some of the cryoprotectants that these frogs use are very toxic to mammalian muscle tissue. So how to come up with a similar chemical for human organs? That's the problem researcher Greg Fahey is trying to solve. The ultimate goal is to be able to set up real banks of organs so that they can be moved anywhere, ready to be plugged in within a couple of hours' notice. After years of work, he thinks he may have come up with a cryoprotectant that's safe for mammals. Like of the uh, chemicals that the frog uses, we have optimized this particular mixture for the mammal over the last 30 years or so. With this mixture, Fahey has successfully preserved rabbit kidneys at below freezing temperatures. He starts by removing as much water as possible. So the kidney might start off being 80% water, we're gonna reduce it to about 30% water. All right, so water out, antifreeze in. Yes. The antifreeze is the key. It's called M22, a strange substance that's not toxic to rabbits or humans. And as you can see at room temperature, it's clearly a liquid. I imagine M22 must, of course, work better than M20 and M21 <laughs> did. <laughs> well, M22 is named because it's intended to be used at minus 22 degrees Celsius, huh. which is minus 8 degrees Fahrenheit. And when they take it down below those temperatures, it behaves strangely. Cooled to below minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Whoa! And it's now like a viscous syrup. Pump this into a kidney, and no matter how cold the organ gets, it won't freeze. How does that work? Unlike solid ice, where molecules are tightly organized, Fahey's cryoprotectant remains liquid no matter how cold it gets. At a certain point, there's insufficient heat energy in the system to maintain molecular motions, and the system just locks up as a solid, but it's not a frozen solid. We're going to a very different kind of solid state. So it's a solid, but it's not it's ice. It's called a glassy solid state, sort of like a window pane. So it's not called freezing organs. You're vitrifying those organs. Vitrifying. It took them about four hours to bring the kidney into this state. This is now solid. The kidney and the solution surrounding it is at a temperature of minus 190 Fahrenheit. It is a solid glass through and through. Frozen only in time. It's just like it was in the liquid state. The only difference is that nothing in the liquid can move anymore. 
And of course, if nothing can move, nothing can change, and nothing can change, then you have perpetual preservation. Forever? Well, A hundred years? Forever, as far as you're concerned. <laughs> Fahey and his team have successfully re-implanted one of these kidneys into a rabbit. And we believe that we can put any organ into a vitrified state with enough effort and time. By making organs colder without actually freezing them, he hopes to make organ banking a reality. If we can do that, then that organ can wait as long as it takes for the right person to come along who needs it. From cooling soldiers and saving heart attack victims to preserving organs, the cold has amazing potential. <laughs>